So now we are going to understand the concept of sample survey which is one of the types of observational studies and is also the most commonly used one also. First of all, let us understand the concept of a population and sample. See, population is basically the entire set of individuals or objects in which we are interested. For instance, if you want to determine what is the weekly time commitment required for a student to successfully complete an NPTEL course, in this case, what will be your population? The population is basically all the students who have registered in the NPTEL course. So you will not be focusing on any other student who has not registered over here. In a similar way, if you want to know what is the average number of hours per week that an Indian in the age group of 18 to 25 dedicates to Twitter, in this case also what you do is, what is your population here? The population is basically all the Indians who are in the age group of 18 to 25. So you will not be focusing on other age groups and also you will not be focusing on those who do not use Twitter. Now the next thing is what is a sample? Sample is basically a subset of the population. Now the question comes up is that why do we need to take a subset of the population and study that? Why don't we just instead consider the entire population or just conduct a census? The answer to it is that it is very difficult to gather information or data from each and every individual of the population. When we talk about census, it is very difficult to gather data because populations are dynamic, they rarely stand still and they change frequently when we move from one time period to another. The second reason is that it is very time consuming, collecting data from such a large group of population is very time consuming and is also very expensive. It requires a lot of funding also. So in this situation, it is not feasible to conduct a census or gather data from each and every individual of the population. Instead, you collect a sample or a subset from the population and study that. And also you notice that sampling is in fact a natural tool for us. It comes naturally to us as we keep on doing sampling in our day to day lives. For instance, if you prepare a soup or if you are going to make noodles, then what do we do? We add all the spices and ingredients in it, we stir it up properly and then we want to check the taste also. What we do is there, we take a spoonful from the soup and taste it and based upon that soup and in that spoon we determine the taste of the entire lot or the soup in the entire bowl. In that case population is what is the population in that case? It is the entire soup in the bowl and sample is basically that spoonful. So based upon the sample you have made a conclusion about the population. Similarly you might have seen that uh, when you visit any market, if you are going to purchase groundnuts, then you might have seen certain individuals stand over there and they randomly pick five to six groundnuts and they first they eat and then if they feel that it is of good quality, then only they place the order. Right? So what they are doing over there? They are just choosing some observations randomly and then they are making inferences about the entire population. So in that case also we are doing sampling. So sampling basically comes very naturally to us. Based upon the sample that you have taken, again it can be further divided into whether it is a random sample or a non-random sample. When we say a random sample, it means that each and every observation in the population has an equal chance of getting selected. So we say that it, we have collected a random sample. Otherwise, if you do it in a non-random fashion or if you do in a biased way, then we refer to it as a non-random sample. So based upon these two ways, you can have different sampling techniques. So the first one based on non-random non sample, 
are your convenient sampling so in convenient sampling as the name itself suggest you collect the data based upon your convenience for instance if you want to know the opinion of the residents in your locality towards a new ai tool what you do is that you just visit the nearest shopping mall and as the individuals pass through that entrance gate you just ask for their opinion in that case what you are doing is that you are simply collecting data based upon your convenience or you can consider another situation maybe in your college you want to conduct a study in which you want to know the opinion of the students towards any new rule which has been floated by the administration so for this you might just go to the auditorium stand near its entrance gate and you just wait for the students to cross and when they come you just randomly ask them the questions so what you are doing in that case you are again doing a convenient sampling next is your volunteer sampling so in this type of sampling people voluntarily participate in the study for instance you might have seen different websites or different news channels they arrange polls and they ask for your opinions right or even if you start your youtube videos then also you get different surveys so not everybody goes and gives opinion on those platforms right those who are interested they might only just give their opinion so these studies just collect that sample data and analyze it and finally make conclusions about that the third one is your purposive sampling so in purposive sampling you target a set of people purposefully for instance if you are interested to know what are the experiences of women who are in the leadership position what you do is that you just simply focus on women executives in tech industry and who have more than 10 years of experience in that case what you are doing is you are not focusing on the broader population of women right you are just focusing on some specific set of people so it is referred to as purposive sampling so all these three are the common non probabilistic sampling so basically they get generated by taking a non random sample from the population because in each case you can see that you are collecting data based upon your convenience either somebody is volunteering for it or maybe you are doing it purposefully so these three are basically done in a non random fashion on the other hand if we talk about probabilistic sampling then the first and the most common sampling technique is your simple random sampling if you look over here in this figure there are some black dots and red dots so these red dots basically represent the ones that have been selected in the sample so simple random sampling basically what happens is that each case is equally likely to be selected here each observation has an equal chance of being selected in the sample for instance if i want to make a committee of 5 students from this class so what i can do is that i can just randomly pick any 5 students so i will not be biased toward any students and collect data from them so in this case each student has an equal chance of getting selected in that committee the next one can be the stratified sampling in stratified sampling what happens is that you divide the population into homogeneous strata and then randomly sample from within each stratum so here if you see this the entire population has now been divided into different stratum and here the red dots within these stratum represent that these are the ones which have been randomly selected right from each stratum we have selected a random sample now to understand this you can con consider a situation suppose that i wanted to make a committee right for five students but i want equal representation from different streams because i know in my class there can be a student from science stream also from an engineering stream 
So what I will do is that I will divide the class into two different streams and from each stream I will randomly pick few students and then form a committee by combining those two. Another situation for this can be suppose your university wants to assess the academic performance of the students. So basically they can divide into different de academic departments and then select from within each department they can randomly select a few of them. So by doing such a study you can see that each department is adequately represented in the sample that you have finally selected right and which is crucial also because because the university wants to assess the academic performance of all the students so it is important that the re equal representation is there from each department. Next we have cluster sampling. So as you can see over here we have divided them into different groups or clusters and the red dots are only present in two clusters. So what we see over here is that we have first divided the population into different clusters but we have picked only two clusters from them and thoroughly studied those two clusters. So first we divide the population into clusters then randomly select a few clusters and from the selected clusters we gather information or data from each observation. To understand this suppose the government health agency wants to assess the health status of individuals in your city. Now see that the, your city is divided into different localities. So what the agency does is that instead of visiting each and every locality they just randomly pick two localities and then thoroughly investigate the health status of each individual within that locality. So they do not have to visit each and every locality and that is why cluster sampling is used in cases where you want to save money, right. So if you do not do that, if you want to visit each and every locality, it is going to be too costly. Next we move on to systematic sampling. In systematic sampling, we basically start with some random house you can see here that we randomly picked one house and then we process a systematic flow which is predetermined for instance you might consider uh, this k value to be 3 and so we can collect data from every third house in the locality. Now this works fine if we have list of all the individuals it is not useful when the population is ordered cyclically or periodically because it is going to repeat every time and you will get a similar set of data. So these are the four commonly used sampling techniques. To sum up you can see over here suppose you want to assess the opinion of the residents in your locality towards the new manufacturing plant that is going to be set up. In order to conduct such a study, you can opt for either of these sampling techniques that we have just studied. Suppose if you want to study, basically con collect a simple random sample, what you will do over here is that you will just randomly pick. So this underlined ones are the ones which have been selected in the sample. So you can see over here that you have randomly selected these houses and from there you are going to collect data. Next, you can divide them into different strata. Strata is in the sense that based upon their income, probably you can divide them and then from within each strata, so this is one strata. So here you randomly pick two of them and here in the second strata, you pick two of them, right? And then ask for the opinions. The third case can be the cluster sampling. So you just go to different buildings which are naturally occurring and then you randomly select two clusters and from within that cluster take opinion of all the residents in those houses. And last is your systematic sampling. So suppose you randomly select the second house and then after that according to some predefined rule you think that okay I will ask data from every third house. 
it is important to see that when you take a random sample from the population then whatever conclusions that you draw that can be generalized for the entire population also here for instance if you are going to assess the academic performance and you have done stratified sampling so you have done it by taking a random sample in that case analysis you have done based upon that random sample the university can generalize and consider it as the performance of all the students however when you have collected a non random sample for instance when you were focusing on your uh, convenience sampling you were collecting data by just standing outside the auditorium or just standing outside the shopping mall in that case whatever conclusions or inferences you draw from that analysis it will be restricted to that sample itself you cannot say that this holds true for the entire population what at max you can say is that it holds true for this set of people okay so that is a basic difference between probabilistic and non probabilistic sampling you can conduct both of them whichever is fine with you but if you want to make your conclusions if you want to generalize your conclusions basically then you need to collect a random sample to understand these different sampling techniques let us consider an example over here in which you want to survey smartphone users regarding their favorite type of mobile app which can be your gaming app or it is a social media app or a chatting app so based upon this you want to get the data first thing is that you might go to a shopping mall and just interview smartphone users as they approach the entrance gate so if you see at this study if i conduct my study in this fashion then it is a convenience sampling right because i am conveniently standing at the entrance gate of a mall and just asking questions to the smartphone users who are approaching that gate next you can obtain a list of smartphone users from a reliable source and randomly select a subset of users from that list in this case it is basically a simple random sampling next you may divide the population of smartphone users by their geographical location and then randomly select a few clusters and survey all the smartphone users within those clusters so this is basically your cluster sampling so you have divided basically the population into different geographical locations and it might be inconvenient for you to reach every geographical region so instead what you do is that you just focus on two or three areas and get data from them only so cluster sampling will be good if you want to understand the regional variation in app preferences and you believe that the geographical location is going to be a significant factor that influences these preferences however if you are interested in understanding the app preferences across different demographics like age or income then you need to conduct a stratified sampling in that case what you will do is you divide the population of smartphone users by their age groups and then take a random sample from each of these groups so in this case it is your stratified sampling so this example tells you that how you can conduct a same study in different ways depending upon your requirement okay remember that cluster sampling is usually preferred when we do not have sufficient budget to visit each and every location or you do not in this instance you are not you were interested rather to see the regional variation in app preferences right and not in the demographics like how it is varying across demographics then cluster sampling was fine but rather if you want to see how the app preferences change over different demographics then you have to conduct a stratified sampling 
Now once you have decided that which sampling technique you will use, the question comes is that now how you will be collecting that data. The first and the most common one is by conducting a personal interview. So in personal interview what we do as it is a very common thing you all must be knowing we conduct it face to face, face to face interactions between the interviewer and the respondents. So interviewer just noted whatever the respondent give the answer. So in this case since you are sitting face to face the response rate is higher because if they have any doubt you can clarify that. The next one is the telephonic interview. Again it is very simple it is most like a personal interview only but it is conducted over phone and it is cost effective. The only issue comes up is that when if the network connectivity is not good the respondent might get irritated or overwhelmed by that and he may not be interested to respond to the questions correctly. The third one is your self-administered question -wise. So self-administered means that you just have to complete the entire questionnaire on your own. It is cost effective and you have high response rate also. But the only thing is that if they need any clarity on any question then they can't approach you as in personal interview they can immediately ask what is the meaning of this question but in self-administered questionnaires they cannot do so. So that is one of the drawbacks over here. The next one is directly observing the data and just noting it down. For instance, it is more common in your biological experiments where you want to suppose see the height of a plant. So you have to each day go and record and directly. So basically what you are doing is that you are directly observing the height of the plant each day and you are noting it down. The last one is the web based survey. So it is conducted online, it is very convenient, it is cost effective, it, ha it can reach a global audience. So the only, it might not be feasible for those who do not have access to internet, right? Otherwise, it is good. So these are the ways in which data can be collected and the response rate is the highest for the first two that is personal and the telephonic interview. So you can devise your questionnaire and the method in which you have to collect the data according to your problem. Now once when we are conducting the sample surveys we are bound to commit some errors or biases. The first one is your convenience sample bias. So whenever we are collecting data based upon our based upon our convenience then automatically some sort of bias is introduced in the data set. The second one can be the non-response bias. See non-response happens when a fraction of individuals who earlier promise to give you the data later they back off. So now the original representative sample of the population now becomes non-representative. In this case or in order to avoid this the interviewer might send repeated emails or reminders to them and clarify them about the objective of this study. And the third one is the bias due to measurement errors which can happen if the wordings of the um, survey or the questionnaire is not proper. Right? So they might not correctly understand the meaning of those words and give incorrect answers. We have seen that what is a sample or what is a population and why don't we just collect data from each and every individual in the population, why that is not feasible for us. Then we have seen that when we are taking a sample it can either be taken in a random or a non-random fashion and based upon these two we have different probabilistic or non-probabilistic sampling techniques. In probabilistic sampling we have convenience sampling or volunteer or purposeful sampling. On the other hand in random sampling we have the four more most common ones that are simple random sampling stratified sampling, cluster sampling and systematic sampling. We have seen different examples in which where they are applicable 
and then we have seen that once we have decided the sampling technique we need to know how we are finally going to collect data are we going to conduct a personal interview or we are going to conduct it over a telephone or just conduct it over online on the internet and finally we have to be careful with certain biases that might come up and we need to resolve them as much as possible thank you